Hey guys, welcome to episode number 60. I'm coming to you live from a hotel closet. It seemed to be the best quality of sound I could find. Well, it's pretty dark in here, but I'm I'm really excited to be on our 60th episode. You know, I just connected with some other food podcasters who are over there 200th episode and sharing some learnings i'm going to be a guest on a few of their shows which i'll be happy to share with you in the next couple months and being invited to conferences in the caribbean and europe really exciting stuff and the way they can connect with people via their podcast and and make a difference and you know network with their their guests etc etc it's all exciting stuff and Today, you know, to continue that excitement, we are going to talk about another massive problem when it comes to food supply, and that is overfishing in the oceans. As you know, there's documentaries like Mission Blue, The End of the Line. It's a problem that's being heavily discussed, and this company is trying to solve that, you know, with farm-raised fish. So I'm going to go right into the episode, and I hope you get as much today as you can, and think a little bit more about the seafood that you are eating. Thanks so much. Welcome to the Food Startups Podcast, connecting the opaque world of food startups. He is the chairman and CEO for Acadia Harvest Inc., a Brunswick company founded in 2011 for land-based indoor aquaculture. And for listeners that don't know what aquaculture is, you know, I didn't really know exactly what that was before we started. You know, the definition is the rearing of aquatic animals or the cultivation of aquatic plants for food. And they are primarily focused on growing saltwater species on land. Right now, they're working with the black sea bass and the California yellowtail. Why is that? Well, they're trying to solve a problem of overfishing in the ocean that we all know about. Plus, they have more control because they're working with something called recirculating aquaculture systems. And we're going to go more into that and explain exactly what that means and why control over the process means healthier and more sustainable food. And he has more than 30 years of experience launching products, services, and growth companies in the life sciences. He was a board member in San Diego He has managed groups dealing with fine chemistry, mammalian and tissue cell culture, industrial enzymes, as well as aquaculture. He has experience in 40 countries, including assignments in England, Mexico, Singapore, and Australia. We are very happy to have Ed Robinson. Ed, how's it going? It's going great, Mac. Thank you for that introduction. You make me sound old. Uh, No, no, no. Experience, not old. (laughs) Ed, well, listen, thanks so much for coming on. I want to go in a little bit to a myth we were talking about, you know, before we started. And most people I know that are into health, they think, okay, oversimplified, farm-raised salmon, bad ocean-raised salmon is good. Can you explain what's really going on here? Well, if you look at seafood consumption in the United States. We'll keep it to the U.S. uh, to make it simpler. Over the last 40 years, consumption has gone from about one pound per person per year to over 14 pounds. That's a huge increase in volume terms. If you look at wild harvests of seafood from our oceans in that same period of 40 years, those harvests are flat. And most scientists uh, are saying that they believe the ability of the oceans to keep up with demand for wild-caught seafood has plateaued and may actually be declining. So if we want to increase human consumption of healthy seafood, omega-3 fatty acids, all of these things that we're told we need in our diets, the only alternative is to farm those uh, seafoods. And we can farm them in the ocean as is done in cages with uh, salmon, for instance, off the coast of Maine, or we can farm those species on land. For many years, people have been growing trout, catfish uh, in, in open ponds or streams, 
And increasingly, the technology of choice is to grow species indoors where you can control the environment. And this can be done both with freshwater species like trout, uh, salmon, or it can be done with saltwater species as we're doing with our California yellowtail and uh, black sea bass. Gotcha. And you had mentioned, um, I believe it's the USDA, correct me if I'm wrong, but they put limits on the amount, you know, to prevent overfishing, they limit fishermen and commercial fishermen onto the amount that they're able to fish from the ocean. At least in terms of the U.S., is that sustainable right now? I mean, are the populations of shellfish and most common fish that we eat, are they at least maintaining or are they still declining despite the USDA regulations? Well, it's actually uh, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Aeronautics Administration that controls uh, fishing quotas. And they have a tough job because you can imagine trying to measure fish populations in vast oceans where uh, you have currents and El Nino weather patterns that cause things to shift dramatically as small species go up and down in population. Those fish that are higher on the food chain, their populations suffer or the fish migrate to another part of the ocean to try to get food. But in general, quotas for many of the most popular fish like cod or or swordfish, uh, black sea bass, have been falling in recent years. And in some cases, they're saying that those populations are either in grave jeopardy or in some cases may never reach the population levels that existed 50 or 100 years ago. Gotcha. Okay. I've heard of two things in the sea that just based on the amount of food that we need, and I realize you guys are trying to solve this problem, but people have spoke about Asian carp and jellyfish as two things that I guess, I think because of, maybe because of global warming, uh, again, I need you to clarify that, but I think it's because of the warming of the ocean for the jellyfish and then Asian carp, I guess they've kind of, I guess they're a very like invasive fish. Yes. They can also be sources for food. That's correct. Uh, the, the Asian carp is a very good example of an invasive species, like so many other invasive uh, plant and animal species that have landed in the United States. They were either brought here intentionally many years ago by people who were well-meaning or, or just interested in a particular species, and now uh, we have a big problem, or they're brought here unintentionally, uh, let's say jettisoned from the ballast of a transoceanic uh, ship, for instance. So in the case of the carp, they can be problematic uh, where they overpopulate a particular water system, pushing out native species. Uh, In some cases, uh, if they're bottom feeders, they can roil the soil on the bottom and disturb uh, native vegetation. That's a critical habitat for young fish or turtles or pollywogs, uh, whatever. I think the, the overriding concern, at least with seafood species, is that As consumers, we tend to be creatures of habit. The top 10 species, haddock, cod, uh, salmon, etc., represent a very small portion of the wild seafood existing in the ocean, but they represent way over 90% of the seafood that we actually consume. So you have a, a situation off the coast of Maine, for instance, where fishermen are landing all kinds of species in their nets or their traps. And when they bring them to shore, only a few of those species actually bring a financial return to them. So they end up either dumping those other species back into the ocean, often the fish are already dead, or those trash species, as they're sometimes labeled, end up being used as fish meal. And it's a great waste of high value protein. Wow. And okay, so yeah, so this is a serious problem. As you mentioned, Noah can't solve this on your own so you guys are that's you know you guys are working to solve that you mentioned you know farm raised and the term ras you also talked about another acronym on imta which i guess is a another i I think it's called integrated multi-trophic aquaculture correct Um, correct let's end this is a challenge for you i know you're a science guy you're a life sciences guy but ed break this down into layman's terms someone who doesn't understand too much about these subjects or doesn't have much exposure to them, I should say. (laughs) And uh, tell us, you know, why they're important and why you guys are working with these two technologies. 
Okay. Well, I'll start with the first thing. Why would we grow these two fish species on land indoors, black sea bass and uh, California yellowtail? The California yellowtail is, represents uh, part of a huge market. Uh, Asian restaurants predominate here. Sushi and sashimi uses for this fish and its cousins. Demand for that kind of food has been growing dramatically over the last uh, couple of decades, six, seven, eight percent a year. And, of course, demand has outstripped the wild harvest uh, that's available. We were surprised to learn when we were out in Santa Monica talking to a potential distributor that many of the customers they have, often uh, sushi chefs, they actually prefer farm-raised fish to the wild-caught yellowtail, mostly because of consistency and quality. The wild fish can vary substantially depending on what they've eaten uh, and, and where they've been swimming in the ocean. In a land-based system, you can control the growth parameters for the fish far better than you can in the ocean. In the case of our two fish species, they prefer temperatures around 74, 75 degrees. Obviously, in the ocean, you cannot control that. The fish try to find ideal growth conditions, but that's not always possible for them. We can provide the right pH, the right oxygen level, the right temperature, and ideal foods for them on a year-round basis. So they're given optimal growing conditions. The other thing that's important to understand here is that by growing on land indoors, you can control the water quality that you're using, and you can control or at least limit the risks of parasites and many diseases that fish may pick up in the ocean if they're growing in uh, confined or close quarters. And Ed, you talked about recirculated water. It says here, like, you know, I've seen articles about this there. It's like about 99.75% of the water and each unit is continuously cleaned and returned to the fish tanks. Uh, I believe like the fecal waste um, is, is filtered, potentially recycled. Um, so it's, your system, I, the recirculation is key, right? Because that means you guys aren't, uh, I would believe some more, I don't want to say primitive, but um, less advanced or other different, or, you know, other farm raised fish may waste a lot more water than you guys do. Well, if fish are grown in the ocean in pens or nets, of course, whatever waste they generate goes into the ocean water and is gradually consumed or broken down through the mechanisms provided by Mother Nature, uh, bacteria, fish, uh, worms, uh, snails, all kinds of uh, species. And of course, plants uh, have a, a role to play there as well using CO2. In a land-based system, you have to deal with the waste. Uh, either you pump it back into the ocean under a discharge permit that's provided by the regulatory authorities, or you take some proportion of that waste and treat it either with chemical systems, mechanical systems, or natural systems, as we're doing, or you can compost it. If it's a freshwater species, it's very common that they take the solid waste and put it on farm land. In some cases, they make growth-producing uh, products that you might spray in your garden, for instance. Our system recirculates about 5% of the water on a typical day, but we're moving towards a system where we'll use a series of natural marine species to consume both the solid and the liquid waste coming out of the fish tanks. So you have both lower wastes uh, in total generated by your fish production, but you're also producing other species that have market value. And that's where this idea of the integrated, multi-trophic aquaculture system comes from. Multiple species growing in balance with each other and using the waste and byproducts from each species to grow another species in what becomes a virtual loop. Wow. And in this loop, what will the other species be, if you can talk about that? Yeah, it could be any number of species, but in our particular case, we're using marine worms, uh, particularly a sandworm, in the ocean. They live in the mud flats. And people harvest them uh, out here in front of my house off the coast of Maine, for instance. They're very efficient at 
uh, consuming both the feces and spent feed products that come off the uh, fish tanks. In the burrow around the sandworm, in that mud flat are uh, colonies of microbes that begin the process of breaking down the liquid waste. Uh, fish, like humans and other animals, generate urine, ammonia-carrying waste, and that has to be broken down to nitrates and nitrites. The next stage in the process is growing microalgae, various natural species of algae. They're very good at using CO2 and with the addition of heat and light, you can grow algae that then become a food source for a shellfish. It might be clams, it might be oysters. And then the final step in the process as we're working with it would be macroalgae, various forms of kelp and, and other large seaweed, or as they're now being called, sea vegetables. And these species are very good at uh, processing remaining waste and re-oxygenating the water before it goes back into the fish tanks. In the end, you're producing species that have commercial value. Sandworms, for instance, are very popular as recreational uh, fish baits. They actually are worth more, substantially more, per pound basis than the fish themselves. Wow. I don't have to explain that, that clams and oysters have value, of course. And increasingly, sea vegetables are becoming very popular in cooking, either as additives to certain types of cuisine. Uh, up here, there's a lot of people uh, eating crunch bars uh, with uh, kelp ingredients in them. And there are materials that can be extracted from some of these uh, sea vegetables as well. Uh, they have antimicrobial qualities. Uh, some of them are used in cosmetics. Some of them are used as food uh, blending ingredients. It's actually amazing to look at the range of materials and their extracts or their byproducts that can be produced using fish waste as a nutrient source. Wow. Okay, so a lot of information there. I'd like to follow up on, I guess, first off, you know, kelp. So I consume kelp sometimes, I mix it with water, and I, I bought this type of kelp. This may not be enough information, but it said, you know, kelp from Iceland. And honestly, there wasn't too much logic behind it. I just thought, all right, well, I know the company, actually, and I was actually just with them at Fancy Foods. But I like that it, Iceland to me, I don't know, so far north, it just sounded clean. But I realized, you know, it's it's not like, I mean, as a consumer, I can't test the level of the heavy metals. I don't know how to do that, right? Do you have any recommendations for consuming kelp? Or how, do, as a consumer, can you, like, I buy, like, the kelp powder, just to clarify, because you know, by price, it's so much cheaper than yeah. buying the capsules. I mean, yeah. how does a consumer even go about knowing if their kelp is, is healthy or maximizing its um, potency? I'm not an expert there, Matt, at all. I think it's the same with fish and meat and other products that we consume. To the extent that you can find out the source of the food, the producer of the food, and the technology and the inputs that they're using in their production methodology, you increase the chances that you're getting first what you pay for. And unfortunately, there's a lot of mislabeling in the food industry. To the extent that you're buying something that's grown locally or at least grown in the United States, you certainly have a higher probability that it's grown to health uh, and safety standards that would be commensurate with our expectations here. There's been a lot of publication about problems with water quality, indiscriminate antibiotic use, slave labor, uh, et cetera, in, in some of these offshore production environments where most of the seafood in the United States comes from. In the case of sea vegetables, most of it today is harvested from the ocean. It's actually a, a growing and robust industry in, here in Maine. There are several different types of seaweed that they're harvesting, and increasingly they're regulating it so that uh, we don't get into over-harvest problems. They're dealing with consumer issues. They're dealing with landowner problems issues and creating areas where you, you can't go harvest seafood to make sure that there are areas set up where fish have breeding grounds and nursery grounds that are not disturbed on a regular basis, or at least during the, the breeding season. Complicated stuff, but I think if you deal with reputable suppliers and you have a sense of, of where these materials come from, how they're produced, 
you increase the chances that you're getting both good value and good health from the sea vegetables you're consuming. Gotcha. And so speaking of misleading claims, so I can tell you, you know, I work with kind of superfoods and dried fruits. And basically, if it's not organic, they'll just call it all natural. But I know the USDA is working on this, but all natural can pretty much mean anything. So all natural is, is literally meaningless. And you could also argue that it's misleading, at least to someone that doesn't know the story behind it. You had told me some stories about sustainable fish, right? Because it's very common to go to a grocery store or to a restaurant and they'll say, well, we have sustainably raised fish. But as you mentioned, that may or may not be the case. Right. Again, I don't want to demean uh, other producers or uh, other production technologies and suggest that ours is the best. It's never that simple. Uh, As we know, in any diverse economy like the United States, people are of different economic means. Uh, The wealthy can afford to eat foods that uh, the poor or people making lower wages cannot necessarily afford to add to their diets. People's expectations and needs vary all across the map as well. But there is no doubt, based on studies done by the Monterey uh, people, that some of the seafood coming into the United States has been grown to standards below those that we would expect of the food showing up in our supermarkets or on the, the tables at our favorite restaurants. And there's no doubt that there's mislabeling of fish and uh, other products. And I don't think that's good for the industry, and I don't think it's good for consumers. What we're trying to do simply is set up a situation where we can tell a distributor, we can tell a chef, we could tell an end user where the juvenile fish came from. In the case of the yellowtail, we have our own brood stock. So working with the University of Maine, we can generate the baby fish that become our production system, if you will. And we can document what those fish are fed, uh, the production environment in which they grow. We use humane uh, systems for harvesting those fish, and we ship them fresh as possible to the distributors for their sales to uh, retail or restaurant consumers of those fish. Does it make it perfect? Does it make it all natural? Does it make it organic? As you pointed out, those terms are either uncertain because there has not been standardization of the meaning of those terms and the definition and the requirements for using those terms. But I think consumers are looking for that. And in coming years, they probably will get better definition and better clarity around their foods. There is a serious attempt to try to find one global standard for the use of the term organic in seafood production. It hasn't emerged yet, but I would expect that it would over the next five to 10 years. Wow. And Ed, I kind of want to go back to something you mentioned, you know, the transparency. The more that you can find out about where your food and ingredients come from, the more that the supplier or the restaurant's willing to share. As a heuristic, as a rule of thumb, it's probably a good sign. You know, the more likely it is to be okay or, or less harmful. So I think that's really good. You know, like I do appreciate when people are as transparent as possible. And, and in my work, I try to be as transparent as possible. Because like we said, you know, you, you can't test your fish for heavy metals on the spot when you go out to a restaurant for a variety of reasons. Um, <laughs> right? So yeah, I think that's great that you guys are going to be able to tell, you know, from birth to what they were eating to the temperature as much as possible. At the very, very least, that's a fantastic start. If I go into a fast food restaurant and I'm hungry and I've got five minutes and I just want to get on the road uh, and I grab a fish sandwich, you know, I'm probably not going to be overly concerned about where that fish came from and was it grown to uh, organic standards, uh, etc. I'd rather not know. (laughs) Maybe I should be concerned, but, you know, there are times where I either don't have time or I don't make the time and brain power available to make a serious value judgment, or it's just not meaningful for me in that particular circumstances. On the other hand, if I go to a high-end restaurant in New York or Boston or San Francisco, and I am looking for a great evening with family or friends or a loved one, and I'm willing to spend the money and the time to get that great meal, then my standards are going to be fairly high. And I expect that if I ask a question, I'll get an answer, and it's an honest 
answer. And recently, <laughs> we were at a restaurant in uh, San Francisco, and they offered yellowtail for dinner. And I said, that's great. Is that fresh yellowtail or is that frozen? And the guy said to me, this is a quote, it's as fresh as it could be. <laughs> And he kind of choked on the phrase at the end and looked at me. It was obvious he was, you know, bluffing me. And I said, well, that's not really what I asked you. If you would please go ask the chef about this. He came back in a couple of minutes and he said sheepishly, I'm sorry, sir, that yellowtail is frozen. Now, <laughs> that doesn't make it bad. And in that particular case, I chose not to eat it because it was another fish on offer that was fresh, and, and I preferred that in that particular setting. But there was a classic example of them trying to misrepresent or fudge what they were offering me at a very high price in a setting where that just should not have happened. Yeah, yeah. okay, totally understand that. It's interesting, like I've been to trade shows, like uh, there's, I'm not sure if you've been, Ed, because you mentioned like nori seaweed and a lot of different marine algae are getting pretty popular. Like I've seen that with kelp and spirulina, which I find to be very interesting. And a lot of times, you know, you hear certain things and um, you can just tell that they're just shooting off the hip. Um, right. But it's good to be aware of that. And Ed, I wanted to finish up on something that I found pretty interesting reading your profile, you know, your background with life sciences and biotechnology. But you also got, let's see, you got a MBA from Rochester Institute of Technology, and then you also did an executive management program. So I feel like you went from kind of a science, you know, life sciences background and then added business in. How helpful was getting an MBA and doing executive management? How did that change the way you looked at running a food business? Well, the seafood business is at the base level farming, uh, having grown up on a farm and having worked uh, on some farms uh, when I was a teenager, it's all about animal husbandry, growing a crop and maintaining a healthy environment. You know, you've got to match your production to the market uh, needs uh, or you're going to fail. In this particular case, having the management background that I do and uh, particularly experience in a regulated environment, working in a multinational environment, I think it helps me anticipate the kind of issues that we're going to have to deal with as we start to sell fish to very large distributors that move the fish all over the United States. But as we look down the road to try to expand our company, work with partners uh, to build new facilities uh, elsewhere, uh, in some cases we hope outside of the U.S., license our technology, and so on. The background that I have in negotiations of contracts, license agreements, uh, royalty agreements, and so on, will certainly be of use. I'm very fortunate to have two fantastic partners, uh, Chris Heinig and Tab Pryor, both of whom are marine biologists by training both of whom have decades of experience in aquaculture and vast networks of contacts and, and peer experts uh, in our industry, we can draw on a great deal of knowledge out there and hopefully solve the problems that emerge as we try to build this business. Wow. You know, listeners, we can find Ed online at AcadiaHarvest.com, Acadia, A-C-A-D-I-A, Harvest.com. Ed, thank you so much for coming to the show today. Is there anything else you'd like to leave listeners with? Well, Matt, I'd like to thank you. Uh, you put a lot of work into setting up this interview and preparing for it. Uh, your question showed a great uh, range of understanding and uh, very provocative questions for me. I'd just like to wish your listeners the best and hope that they uh, – can help the seafood industry continue to grow and prosper and raise the standards so that all of us can get that good, healthy, value for money food that we're looking for. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. All right. Hey, guys. Thanks so much for listening. And as always, if you have any questions or comments, find us online at foodstartupspodcast.com.